Okay, so uh, we're in 1.2 <clears throat> vector spaces. So if you remember the definition of a vector space, uh, that meant a set of objects that we call vectors uh, on which addition um, makes sense. So the set is closed under addition of vectors, is closed under scalar multiplication of vectors, where the scalars are chosen to be in a set which is called a field, right? Community ring with unity, every non zero element would be a unit. Mm. And then on top of that, we had eight properties, right, that had to be satisfied. The addition of vectors was commuted, it was associated, there was a zero vector, there was an inverse vector with respect to addition, so on and so forth. And we've seen one example uh, that was Fn, or the set of n uh, tuples. Um, if you um, want to have some kind of um, geometric image in your mind about this, it would be like constructing R to the N out of R. So vectors, right, with N entries in R would be constructed in that way. Okay, so example two. Uh, matrices. of size M uh, by N over a field F. Uh, that would mean, of course, the size M, M by N by every entry should be uh, from that field F. Uh, so such a matrix uh, will look like this. Uh, we'll denote the entries by A, I, J. Um, so basically, something like that, A11, A12, A1N, AM1, AM2, AMN, M rows and N uh, columns. Uh, so let's see that this is a vector space. over the field F. Uh, so what do I need? I need this set to be closed under addition, addition of matrices. True, right? Add two M by N matrices. M and N are fixed, right? Add two M by N matrices, you still get an M by N matrix. Uh, if you multiply a matrix by a scalar, what does that mean? You just multiply every entry, right, of the matrix by that scalar. So it's still in the set, matrices M uh, by N. Um, property one, addition of matrices is commutative. True, right? It doesn't matter in which order you add. Multiplication was a problem, right, with matrices, but addition is fine. Uh, property two, addition of matrices is associative. Yeah, definitely true. Uh, property three, let me just make sure I uh, look at them in order. Uh, property three, there exists a zero matrix. Yes, there is such a thing with zero everywhere, right? In every entry. Uh, property four, uh, there exists an inverse matrix, but by inverse, I don't mean in the sense of multiplication inverse, right? I mean with respect to addition. What would that matrix be? Just place negatives in every entry of the original matrix. Um, property, that was four. Property five. For every vector, which is now a matrix, one times the vector equals that vector. Yeah, if you multiply a matrix by one, it means you multiply every entry of the matrix by one, so nothing changes. Property six. A, B times a vector equals A times B times the vector, A and B are scalars. Any problem with that? No, definitely not. Uh, property seven, uh, scalars distribute over a matrix addition. A times X plus Y equals AX plus AY, definitely. And property eight, Scalars addition distribute over multiplication. So A plus B times the matrix equals A times the matrix plus B times the matrix. Definitely true. So everything is straightforward. Do uh, you want me to write down any of this or it's pretty clear? Clear? Okay. Um, 
there is a question in the book, kind of similar to the types of questions we've seen last time, where you change the field, right, and see what happens. So it's number 16 on page 15. It says that V denotes the set of all M by N matrices with real entries. So the field is R. So we're talking about matrices M by N over R. Uh, therefore, V is a vector space over R, right, according to this example. Let F be the field of rational numbers. It's a field together with addition and regular multiplication, right, among rational numbers. <clears throat> Is V a vector space over this field F? So let's try to remember where did the scalars or the field actually come into play in the definition of the vector space. Uh, they come into play um, for that first thing of being closed under scalar multiplication, right? Is this V closed under multiplication by rational numbers? Those are matrices with real entries, right? If I multiply by a rational, the entries are still real. No problem. Okay. Then I'm going to skip through properties one, two, three, four, five, right? All those properties that don't involve scalars in the definition of the vector space, they will automatically be satisfied, right? So I go directly to properties six, seven, and eight which are the ones involving um, scalars. So now, uh, property six, for instance. Let's look at that. Property six says that for any two scalars in F and for any vector X in V, so matrix for us, uh, we have that A, B, X is A, B, X. The field is, you know. Any problem with that? Not really, because we know that this property is satisfied for any scalars in R, right? Because V used to be a vector space over R, so this holds for any A, B in the original field R. In particular, right, it will hold for any rational numbers A and B. So uh, in particular, properties six, seven, and eight, which all of them are about scalars, will hold. Okay. That was example two matrices. Example three. Uh, so here we're going to start with a field F.
and the non empty set S. And we look at the set containing all the functions from the set S to the field F. So we're going to define the set denoted like this, script F of S and F, defined as the set containing all the functions defined on S with values of F. Uh, with one uh, specification here in the sense that we're going to say that two functions f and g in that set are equal provided that they are equal for every element of the set right so the domain is this set s and two functions will be called equal if they agree on that domain we don't really care what happens outside that set S. Right. All right, so now this set becomes a vector space over F. We're going to need the operations, right? So we're going to need vector addition. The vectors are functions now. So I need to know what this should be. Um, but that's just the natural definition of function addition. And then scalar multiplication, C times F. Is again, naturally defined to be C times F of S at every point in the domain. Okay, so vectors will now be functions in this set. Um, so, do you want to go through the properties why this becomes a vector space, or you think it's clear? Let's go through that. Okay, so our set, let me call it V because it's kind of long to talk about all that. So this V, is it closed under addition? When you add two functions from S to F, both of them, do you get another function from S to F? Yes. So closed under addition. Is this set V closed under multiplication by scalars? Right. When I multiply a function by a scalar, like here, I'm going to get a new function, right, in the same set. Okay. Um, property, so now those are the basic two properties and now the eight things, right? Property one of the definition, function addition is commutative. Yes. Property two, function addition is associative. Definitely. Property three, there exists a zero in this V. What's the zero? The zero constant function, right? So the function that sends everything in the domain to the zero of the vector of the field F. Right? So let me note that. Property three, zero in this V is F from S to F, F of every element is zero. Okay. Property four, for every function F in V, there exists a function, let's say G in V, such that F plus G equals zero.
when I say f plus g equals zero, I mean the zero vector, which is the one defined above, right, in property three, or the zero function. Um, how do you define g? g of every element would be negative f of that element. Uh, property five for every function f in v one times that function equals the function if you multiply a function by one nothing changes right we have the definition of the scalar multiplication up there so nothing will change uh, properties six, seven, and eight, the ones about scalars. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, or any, so the function, this one here, you mean, right? Yes. So f is that function that maps everything to zero. The, the function constant equal to zero on the set S. Okay? Because only that function will not change any other function under addition. Right? This function here, f of s equals zero for every s. If you add it to any function, it will not change that the, the function right that you're adding it to because you're always adding zero for every value of s. Okay, so um this is just, you know, something that would also be denoted like this, constant will equal to zero. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, what I meant is this, the zero vector in V is this function F. Okay, so yeah, yeah, I see what you mean now. Maybe I should have written like, instead of F, uh, f sub zero or something, you know, just give it a special name. Yeah, f represents that zero function. That's what I meant. It's a matter of, you know, words and notation here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what was I saying about uh, property six, seven, eight? So let's look at one of them, like six. I treat to, you know, I treat them all kind of the same, six, seven, eight, because they are all about distributing or doing something with those scalars. So six is saying something like this for any A and B in F, and for any element of the vector space, so for us a function, A times B times F equals A times B F. Where multiplication is again done according to this relation here, right? C times uh, F of a point is C times F of that point. So if I look at the left side here, hopefully it's clear what's going on. If I take the left side and apply it to a point S, I just get AB times F of S, right? And then if I take the right hand side and apply that to a function to a to a point S, that would be a times the function bf at s, which again is defined to be b times f of s. So anyways, it is a matter of this being equal to that, the two underlying quantities. And where are they? So where does this happen? It happens inside the field f. Right, because that's where F takes you into the field. A and B are in the field as well. As well, and we know that in any field, multiplication is associative, right? So this kind of property holds. So those two things are equal. Yes, multiplication is associative in any field. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
x. By x, I meant multiplication. Let me put it down. Okay, and similarly, 7 and 8 would go in the same way. Questions? Okay. Example 4. Hmm? I mean, I, I called the previous one three. Matrices two and one was Fn last time. A special type of function, those would be the polynomials. Okay, so I'm going to look at polynomials with coefficients in a field F. So P of F, polynomials of any degree you want. Okay? P of F will become a vector space over F. And in order to, to do that, we need to specify the two operations, right? So how do I add two polynomials? By the like terms, but um, there is a, I mean, it's easy to say that you add them, right? But they might have different degrees, right? That's the only problem. So you have to be a bit careful if you really want to write it down uh, correctly. So um, if, let's say, P and Q are polynomials, um, degree of P is n, degree of Q is m, and let's just assume that n is the one that is large. And just for completeness, let me you know, actually write them out. So P X is A N X to the N plus A N minus one X to the N minus one plus A one X plus A zero. Q as degree M B M X to the M plus B M minus one X to the M minus one plus B1x plus B0. So if those are the two polynomials that I want to add, then P plus Q will have what degree? The higher of the two, right? So N. Let's say Cn x to the n plus Cn minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus C1x plus C0, where what are those coefficients? Ci will be equal to Ai plus Bi for what values of the index i? So I can combine the like terms, but from 1 to 
m, right, to the power of m, the smaller of the two. So i is between 1 and m. Uh, you get the coefficient as the sum. And if it's larger than m, just a. Right, because from M on, we don't add anything to the terms in P of X. So theoretically, it's easy formally to actually write it down. It's not so nice, but it's doable. So that is addition of polynomials of any degree. Uh, there is a second operation that we need, and that is multiplication of polynomials by a scalar. Uh, so the P is a polynomial um, and C is a scalar uh, then we're going to define this scalar multiplication exactly as we did with functions right after all polynomials are functions so C times P of X uh, is you just are currently uh, so the only person of X. in this conference uh, C P of X is just C times P of X. Okay. So now we have the operations that are set. Um, furthermore, when do we say that two polynomials are equal? Well, to be equal, they must have the same coefficients, but they must have the same degree as well, right? The degree also uh, matters. All right, so let's see why this is a vector space. Closed under addition of polynomials. I add two polynomials, I get the polynomial, right? Closed under a multiplication of polynomials by a scalar. I still get the polynomial, still works. Property one, addition of polynomials is commutative, definitely. Actually, all those properties will work because we just checked them for functions, right? Polynomials are functions, and I don't want to go through all that again, so they will automatically be satisfied. Good. Yeah. It is, and you're right. Thank you. Uh, so, by the way, a polynomial that is just constant, equal to 3, let's say, what degree does that have? Zero, right? Because it's the highest power of x. But what about a polynomial that is constant, zero? Because theoretically, the, um, the degree of the polynomial is defined to be the highest power of x with a non-zero coefficient. So if my polynomial is zero, that kind of doesn't make sense. And we're going to say that the degree is negative one. Right? So if polynomial is constant equal to zero, we'll say the degree is negative one. If it's a constant number other than zero, it will be degree zero. But it's just a custom kind of thing. This time. OK. Now, uh, we'll look into some properties of vector spaces. Uh, so first of all, we have what is called cancellation law for vector addition. So if you have three vectors x, y, z in a vector space v over a field f, uh, such that x plus z equals y plus z, so this relation here, then you can cancel out the z and x would have to equal y. And again, those could be any vectors, but, but now by vectors we learn that we don't necessarily mean vectors in the sense that we've seen before. I mean, we, we can mean matrices, we can mean functions, right? Whatever the space is. We we'll call them all vectors, but pretty much they could be anything. Okay, so let's try to prove this. So how can I cancel that z there? 
Um, if you look at the, the, if you think about the definition of the vector space, we have that property four there, which says that every vector has an inverse with respect to addition, right? So property four of the definition vector spaces. And I'm going to apply that for Z, the vector Z. So using this property, there exists a vector U such that Z plus U equals the zero vector. Okay, but now I'm going to take the uh, relation that is given and just add U to both sides. And again, I know that addition is associative, so I can regroup there the parentheses. And because z plus u is zero, and zero plus any vector is that vector. we conclude that x and y must be equal. So really uh, straightforward proof. Uh, corollary one. The vector zero of property three, property three of the definition said there exists a zero vector, right? But it doesn't say it's unique. It makes sense that the vector, the zero vector should be unique, and it is. Um, the vector zero in property three of the definition of the vector space is unique. Property three again of the definition. The vector space. So how do we prove uniqueness in general in mathematics? Contradiction, so you just go ahead and assume that there is another one, right? That is not unique. So let me just assume there exists a zero prime, let's call it. So vector. Another zero vector, so uh, it would have that property that when you know when you added this zero prime to any x, nothing changes, right? And I want to show that zero and zero prime are actually equal. Or if I go, you know, with a proof by contradiction, I want to show that something strange happens. All right. So here's how I'm going to use this. Now, because this property here that I wrote holds for every vector x in V, it will in particular hold for the zero vector, right, that, that V has. So if I apply it for x equals zero, that would mean the zero vector plus this new zero vector equals the zero vector, right? Okay, so let's uh, keep this in mind. And then note another thing. The zero vector, the one that V originally had, what property does that vector have? So being the zero vector, zero plus anything equals that anything. So x 
plus 0 equals x for any x in b, just because 0 is the 0 vector. So what vector should I apply this for? Zero prime. Okay. So now let's look at the two things that I got. This one and this one. They must be uh, equal. Okay. All right, two. Uh, property four of the definition, the existence of that inverse vector with respect to addition. Again, you're not told that the inverse is unique, but it has to be. Okay, corollary two says exactly that. Vector y in property four of the definition of vector spaces. is also unique and the proof of this will be part of your homework which is straightforward as the ones above that left this homework um, this vector y Now that we know uh, that it is unique, it's also denoted by negative x, right? Um, because it is the inverse in respect to addition, uh, after all. Uh, theorem 2. In any vector space V, the following statements are true. The first statement, there are two zeros in there, right? Part A. Uh, what does each of the zeros mean? You see how they are kind of differently written? Or no, you don't notice that they are different? So one of them is a scalar and one of them is a vector. Which one is which? So you cannot multiply two vectors, right? So the left one has to be the scalar. And uh, of the one on the right has to be the uh, vector, or what I call the zero with a double bar or whatever. Okay, so here's how you prove something like property uh, A. Uh, well, actually, let me just so zero x is the same as zero plus zero x, right? I can replace a zero by a zero plus zero. But then addition of scalars distribute over multiplication of vectors. So this is zero x plus zero x. Okay. 
okay? 0x, 0 times x is a vector, correct? I multiply the vector by the scalar 0. I can add to it the 0 vector and nothing will change, right? That's still the left side of the equation above. The right side is 0x plus 0 times x. And now that it's written like this, according to theorem 1, which was the, the one with the cancellation, right? You're allowed to cancel. And we are uh, done. Part B. Part B is about the inverse of this element a times x, right? So I take the element a times x, which is here in the middle, and when you put a negative sign in front of it, it just means that you're talking about the additive inverse, right, of that vector. So I'm looking at a times x, and I would like, um, well, I would like the additive inverse to be negative a times x, which is the first one, right? So if I do this, well, first of all, I can write this, and hopefully it's uh, clear, right? So if I write it like this, I, I'm just saying that the additive inverse of ax is this vector, the second one. Um, but I can also look at it like this. So what happens if I add ax to negative a times x? A scalar multiplication, remember, it distributes, so I can like factoring out. So it is a plus negative a. So I get 0 times x, which by part a we know. That's the zero vector. Okay. So now if I combine the two um, uh, equations, the first and the second, they would both equal the zero vector, so they're equal to each other. I can cancel. So what I'm doing here might seem really trivial, right, if you think from the point of view of real numbers. However, in this abstract setting of vector spaces, um, it has to be proved because negative, so this first thing here, negative quantity ax just means the vector that is the inverse with respect to addition of ax. While if I look on the right here, I'm just taking the additive inverse of a in the field, right, and then multiplying by the vector. So theoretically, the notions are disconnected, but, uh, you know, using the definition after all of the vector space, it all makes sense as they should, right, with real numbers. Okay, so uh, this is the first equality of property B, uh, negative A times X equals negative AX, so we need to look at the um, uh, third one, right, A times uh, negative X. So I'll start with A times negative X. And I look at it like this. Because now, uh, according to this thing that is written above, for a equal to 1, that says negative x equals negative 1 times x, correct, in particular. And that's exactly what I, what I wrote here a times negative x equals a times negative 1 times x. OK. 
okay? But multiplication by scalars is associative. So that is the same as a times negative 1 times x. And a times negative 1, that happens inside the field f. That is just you know, negative uh, a. And negative a times x, again, according to this property that we just checked above, is the same as negative a x. So we're done. So those are all three things that had to equal each other. Okay. Property C. A is a scalar, that zero is the zero vector on both sides, right, in property C. So multiply the zero vector by any scalar, you still get the zero vector, perfectly reasonable and trivial again, right? And we're going to prove this one uh, kind of similarly as part A above. I'm going to do, so this is what we need. So A times the zero vector, I can rewrite the zero vector as zero plus zero. And then distribute. And then I can also add a zero here on the left because nothing will change if I do that. And I'm just looking at the end result. Um, by cancellation again, I'm going to cancel A times zero. And I'm going to end up with what I need. So very, very similar to property A. Let's prove it. Questions? All right, so this is the end of uh, 1.2. So we'll continue with section 1.3, uh, which is about uh, subspaces of vector spaces. Here is the definition. So we start with a vector space V over a field F. And W is initially just a set of vectors in V, right? So a subset of uh, V. So I want to know when this W has a nice structure in the sense that uh, it is what we'll call a subspace of V. And being having a nice structure actually means being a vector space by itself with the operations that V have, has. So it's, it's kind of similar to the idea of groups and subgroups, if you remember from, from abstract algebra. So um, it's like a subset becoming a group with the same operations of the deep space, exactly the same idea here. Um, so... <clears throat> Trivially, if W, uh, so I'm talking now about subsets of the space V. Uh, the extreme cases will be when the subsets are either just zero or everything, right? So if W is the entire space V, it trivially, right, will be a vector space. Uh, so it is going to be. subspace of B. So B is a subspace of B, trivially. The 
opposite case will be the set containing just zero. Zero is a vector. This is also a subspace um, of P. Let's take a minute and think about this. Um, so to be a subspace, according to that definition, it means that W should be a vector space with the same operations that V had, right? So W for us is represented by zero alone, right? So let's think about this set, zero by itself. Is it closed under addition of vectors? Yeah, if you add zero to zero, you still get zero. Is it closed under multiplication by scalars? Any scalar times the zero vector is still the zero vector, right? So yes to both. Uh, think about the properties. Vector addition is commutative. It's just about zero plus zero here, right? Associative, uh, everything distributes. Yeah, everything will be nice and easy because I can only use the zero vector, right? So everything is trivially satisfied. So zero by itself will be a subspace of V. So again, those are the extreme cases. We're not really too interested in them, right? It's more interesting what happens in between. So if you're given some subset, non-trivial subset of a vector space, how do you figure out whether it is a subspace or not? Okay. So now, let's go through the definition and through the properties and see what we need to have. If now W is just a subset of V, and say non-trivial, and it's going to be a subspace, if and only if. Okay, so let's see what should happen. Uh, w should be a vector space by itself, right, with the same operations. What does that mean? W should be closed under vector addition. Could that be a problem? Yes, it could. Because if I just take an arbitrary set of vectors in V and then just pick two of them and add them up, it doesn't mean that the sum will land in my arbitrarily chosen set of vectors. So that could be a problem. So I'm going to write it down. Any two vectors, x and y in W. X plus y is in W. So W has to be closed under vector addition. What about scalar multiplication? If I pick a set of vectors however I want, and pick one of them in there and multiply it by any scalar I, I want, is it automatically satisfied that all those multiples will be in the set? Not really, right? I have to be careful there. So two, for any C in the field and for any X in W, the X has to be in W. W must be closed under scalar multiplication. Okay, now those were the two beginning, you know, things from the beginning, and now I'll go through the eight properties. Property one, is it automatically satisfied that addition of vectors on W is commutative? Right, so imagine V of vector space with all the eight properties satisfied. Imagine choosing some vectors from V calling that, you know, that set W. If I add two vectors from W, will that operation be commutative? Yes, why? They're in V, right? The addition of vectors is commutative on the entire space V. So if I take two from W and I add them, it doesn't matter in which order I add them, I still get the same thing. So I'm not going to list that as a condition for W because it will automatically be satisfied. Okay, addition of three vectors 
all three from W should be associated. Yes, because addition of vectors on the entire space is associative in particular, you know, for W. So I'll skip that. Property three. There exists a zero vector in W, right? I'm looking through the properties for W now. There exists a zero vector in W such that X plus zero equals X for any X in W. So there exists one in V, but I don't know that if that thing is in W. So it would have to be in there, right? So I'll put property three here. So I'm saying here that W must have a zero vector. Could this be another zero? Another one from the one that B had? Or it must be the same one that B had. So can I replace this by saying the zero of B must be an element in my set W? Yes. If there is no way that W would have another zero vector, because then we run into that problem with a zero prime, right? I would just say that zero prime plus x equals x for any x in w, and then zero plus x equals x for any x in w, and zero and zero prime would have to be equal. So uh, w has a zero vector, but this zero vector must be at the zero of b. It cannot be another vector. All right, that was property four. Property five, for any x in W, one times x equals x. I don't see why not, because that holds for any x in B, right? So in particular, it holds for W. Um, wait, I skipped one, and that's really important. I skipped four, uh, the one with the inverse. For any x, in, so I'll, I will read it for w again. For any x in w, there exists a y in w such that x plus y equals zero. Right, so there might, might be a problem there because for any x in w, since w is part of v, there will be an inverse, right, y. But that inverse is in v, right? I don't know if that inverse will be in w or not. And that might be the problem. So I'm going to uh, put it down here for, for any x in the set w, there must exist a y in w. And with x plus y equal to 0. All right, so it looks like checking those four things is enough, right? We don't need to go through the entire list of the eight conditions plus the two things on top, so 10 things to be checked. So from 10 to 4 is pretty good, right? And it turns out that it's even better than this. You only need to check three of them, and those will be the first three. The, the, the next result, which is this theorem here, will actually show that Property four will be implied by everything above. So that's theorem 1.3. So let me look at the theorem here. Look what it says. W is a subspace if and only if the following three conditions hold. Zero, the zero vector is in W, that's what we called condition three above. B, sorry. Yeah, B is, what is B saying? That W is closed under vector 
addition, right? X plus Y is in W. Whenever X and Y are in W, that's what we call condition one above, being closed under vector addition. And C, W is closed under multiplication by scalar. So four, this one here, is missing. So it must be implied by everything else, right? Let's look through that. Okay, so this is an if and only if kind of result. So we'll have to go in both directions with the proof. Let's go in that direction first. And that means I'm assuming that W is a subspace of B. And I want to show that A, B, and C hold. Well, I'm assuming that W is a subspace, which by definition it means that W is a vector space, correct? Being a vector space means it has a zero, but we've already went through that and we said that if it has a zero, it must be the zero of B, right? There is just no way to be another zero. So that's A, right? Which says that zero belongs to W. Being a vector space, it automatically means that it's closed under addition and under scalar multiplication, and those are properties B and C. So A, B, and C are, you know, trivially satisfied under the assumption that W is a vector space. Okay. Uh, the main part of the proof would be going backwards, right? Uh, because remember, we're missing this property for there, right? So it's, we have to show that four is still satisfied with only three assumptions, A, B, and C. So now let's assume that A, B, and C hold. I want to show that W is a subspace of A. So let's see what we need in order to show that W is a subspace. So to be a subspace, it must be, again, a vector space, right, by itself with the two operations. What does that mean? Closed under addition. Is W closed under addition? Yes, because we're assuming properties A, B, and C, and property B says exactly that. W is closed under addition. Okay, move on. Is W closed under scalar multiplication? Yes, that's exactly what property C assumes. Okay. Property one of the definition of vector spaces. Addition on W is commutative. Here we go again for the properties, right? We said that some of them matter and some of them are automatically satisfied. One will be automatically satisfied, right? Addition being commutative. Two, addition is associative, automatically satisfied. Um, three, the zero vector is not automatically satisfied. However, it's our assumption, right? Part A. Okay, four. And now we arrive to four, which is the one that I circled here, which we said that is not the only other one that is not automatically satisfied, right? And now it's not assumed, so we must be able to prove it somehow, right? So all we need is this. For any x in w, there exists a y in w. such that x plus y equals the zero vector. 
if we can show this, we're done, right? All the other properties we said that uh, they will be satisfied. So let me start with an X in W. X being W is in V, right, in particular. In V, it has an additive inverse, correct? We call that negative X. This negative X would be the Y that we need to find, right? But I would like it to be in W. So far, I only know that it belongs to V. Okay. But this negative X, according to... Go back. According to this, negative x with a equal to 1 here, negative x equals negative 1 times x, correct? Negative 1 times x, where x is in w, right? And negative 1 is in the field, right? So what happens is that negative x is a scalar multiple of x, right? But didn't we just assume that w is closed under all scalar multiples, right? That was property C. So when I do negative 1 times x, I automatically land in w according to property C. And we're done, right? The additive inverse will have to belong to W. So that's what I was saying up here, that it's automatically implied by theorem 1.3. Okay, so this theorem allow, allows us to check only three things out of 10 in the end, right? So when you need to check that something is a subspace, you only need three things, closed under addition, closed under scalar multiplication, and checking that the zero vector belongs to your set, right? Let's look at some examples, or maybe one example. So v. Oops. Uh, let V be the set of matrices n by n, that's only one n in there, but it means square matrices over n. And W is the set of symmetric matrices. Remember what that meant? Do it not. Those are matrices that are equal to their transpose. To get the transpose of the of matrix, you just you know transform rows into columns, right? That's how you get the transpose. You know, for a matrix to be symmetric or equal to its transpose, it necessarily has to be square because when you take the transpose, you switch the dimensions. So if it's m by n, it becomes n by m. So to be equal, they have to be square matrices. All right, so those are the symmetric. matrices. So it's just a set of matrices, right, in uh, V. W is a subset of V. Uh, v itself is a vector space, right, over F. We've seen, we've been through that with matrix addition and scalar multiplication. We want to show that this W is a subspace. Right? So what do we need? Three things, right? The zero of the vector space, so condition one, the zero of the vector space V should be in W. What's the zero of the vector space V? The 
the zero matrix, right? Zero n by n matrix. Is the zero n by n matrix a symmetric matrix? Definitely, right? If you take the transpose of the zero matrix, nothing will happen, right? You still get the zero matrix. So it's symmetric. W should be closed under vector addition. So if I take two matrices in W, their sum should still be in W. Basically what I need is that the sum of two symmetric matrices is also symmetric, right? How would I check that? Well, I would have to look at the transpose of the sum, right? The transpose of the sum, if you remember this, but it's pretty straightforward to check. Transpose of the sum is the sum of the transposes. You can check this entry-wise um, if you want to do that on your own, um, because the transpose matrix has the ij entry equal to the ji entry of the original matrix, right? So if you take the transpose of a plus b, it will have the ij entry as the ij entry, the ji entry of a plus b. But that, that's the ji entry of a plus the ji entry of b. So ij of a transpose plus ij of b transpose. So um, a and b were symmetric. So a equals a transpose and b equals b transpose. So we're done. And three, w should be closed under uh, scalar multiplication, right? So if a is in w and c is a scalar, then C times A should also be in W. So it should also be a symmetric matrix. Why does that hold? If I have C times A, and then I take the transpose, what happens? That's the same as C times the transpose of the matrix A, right? Uh, again, you can think in terms of the ij entries, right? Because c times a, everything transpose, we will have as the ij entry the ji entry of c times a, and that's c times the ji entry of a. So c times a transpose. And a equals a transpose. Is it for symmetric? So they are not okay. Okay. Um, Similarly, uh, you can show that, for instance, the subset of diagonal matrices is a subspace, right? Because zero is a diagonal matrix. The sum of two diagonal matrices is diagonal. A scalar times a diagonal matrix is still diagonal. Same with upper triangular, same with lower triangular, as long as you don't mix them, right? If you just take that set, it will um, automatically work. Okay. So um, we're still not done with 1-3. There is one more uh, result here, but I will post some homework uh, due next week. We'll post that um, on Canvas under assignments from sections 1-1, one, 1-2, one, one, and 1-3. Any questions? Yeah, it will include what I said would be assigned as homework. Corollary 2, I think, it was. Mm -hmm.